Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. Today, uh, our readings are mar- for March 24th, 2024. And uh, the text options uh, are for Palm Sunday or Passion Sunday. And in a moment, we'll talk about uh, those uh, uh, two very different options for approaching this particular week. Our texts are from uh, Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 through 9a. The psalm is Psalm 31, verses 9 through 16. Our epistle is Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. And then our choice of the gospel is from Mark. And uh, we have Mark chapter 15, 1 through 39, or we could go all the way through 47. Or Mark 14, 1 through 15, 27. And the alternative reading is still in Mark, so get these zip codes. This would be the procession of Psalms. Uh, the, which of the procession of the palms, which would be Mark 11, verses 1 through 11. And so I set up, we talk about uh, just choosing uh, which direction uh, you might want to go for this particular Sunday. Well, the fact, Joy, that it, it, that it took you that long to name all of the texts for the, <laughs> for today. It's a little it's bit. In, it's indicative of of the challenge for preachers, right? We were talking about this before we went live in that there are a lot of factors that go into how to make this, uh, how to how do you acknowledge this Sunday? And mm-hmm. uh, liturgically, of course, one of the shifts, um, one of the more recent shifts has been to include the Passion, you know, Passion Palm Sunday, because of, uh, just to remind people that people are, you know, the, well, I shouldn't say it this way, but Jesus is going to die this week before you get to Easter in case you don't come to Good Friday uh, services. But but it's a lot. It is so much to decide. And do you do passion? Do you do palm? Do you do everything? Um, and knowing that there are a lot of other liturgical decisions that are being made on this Sunday. So uh, so we did met, we did we did talk about that before we went live and and acknowledge that you know what then what becomes the uh, what becomes the focus of course is your own but uh, textually we can maybe offer some offer some guidance there. What do you all what do you both think? Matt? Well, there's a lot, and and a lot of it deserves to be read because they're important texts. Uh, you know, there's the one problem though is a lot happens in Mark 11 verse 12 before we get to chapter 14. So you want to avoid the impression that Jesus comes into town and they kill him right away for no good reason. Mm-hmm. From the authorities' perspective, they kill him for some very good reasons. Right. Um, right. From their perspective, mm-hmm. and uh, so you want to avoid that to make it as if he just comes to Jerusalem to die or to offer himself to die and for no other reason. Mm-hmm. And I think also, I think you, I think you need to preach on these texts, whatever texts you choose. I think reading them isn't enough because mm. there is so much misunderstanding about the historical realities, the theological significance that each gospel author ascribes to what's going on. You can't do it all. Don't try to do it all. But we, we hamper ourselves in the church when we only talk about these texts during Holy Week. Mm-hmm. 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 And we can't do anything about that right now because it is Holy Week. But of, of all the weeks to spend some time doing some instruction as you preach, this seems the time to do it. The pitfall, of course, is to try to say everything, which no one can do. No, no. I often, I often make uh, the point. I don't know if I did this year of uh, the significance uh, of February being Black History Month and attending to uh, making note of that um, throughout the month, that um, if you followed your feeds, there uh, was always some type of recognition of uh, uh, the indication of why we take a month to acknowledge uh, Black history. And now in March, it's uh, women's history, and we're identifying uh, women's roles in history, sometimes roles that have been ignored or almost erased from history, uh, clearly forgotten. 
Um, if you have any feeling about that, this is the time to pay attention to. If you want to do, if you're in the midst of a series and, and it's not telling folks why Christians follow Jesus and the significance of this event, I want to tell you, stop and take attention to it here. And that's that's what I hear when Matt is saying, you have to preach these texts. Don't just read them. Um, I'm, I'm not going to identify, but I once heard a, a, a high church holiday sermon that was on leadership, where the text and the life of Jesus was incidental, actually insignificant. And we all know that we're going to get some folks who may only show up this month, may only show up this week, uh, because of however it is you choose to celebrate this particular Sunday. Make sure they understand the significance of this story, not as a metaphor for something that will cause success in our life, but as the very uh, foundation of our faith in God that has been demonstrated in the fleshly life of Jesus Christ. Well, wow. When you were saying that, Joy, I, I, when I was doing the prep for the podcast this week, I was inclined toward, if we start with Passion Sunday, so we start with the, with the, the passion narrative from Matt, uh, from Mark, Mark, I, I was, I was drawn toward to the, the, mention of the women right at the at the at the cross and verse 40 and 41 there were also women looking on from a distance among them were mary magdalene and mary the mother of james and the younger and of joseph and salome these used to follow him and provided for him when he was in galilee and there were many other women who had come up with him to jerusalem and this the verb there these used to fo- they used to follow him and provided for him is uh diaconio or uh mm-hmm. it's the, it's the service right and so uh we so here we have it in 1541 uh but it's also what it's uh, it's also descriptive or summarizing of Jesus ministry himself in 1045 it came not to serve but to be served and you have in 113 the angels serving Jesus waiting on him in the wilderness and um, 131 Simon's mother-in-law is um, healed and begins to serve them Jesus describing his own ministry in 1045 and just the reminder of the women providing for him and serving him and how they're doing that here as well. And so, and I was connecting that with Audrey West's question uh, that, that opens her commentary the passion account unfolds, okay, okay, as if challenging readers, listeners, and preachers to consider again their own answer to the question Jesus asked at Caesarea Philippi, who do you say that I am? I am? And so what if the answer were one whom I serve or one who does serve and what that what that looks like? Uh, and so I, I haven't completely flesh this out homiletically, but I was, I was really taken with that connection that they, that these women now also are described in ways uh, that, uh, that the way in Jesus, Jesus himself experienced service <laughs> throughout his life and here, and then, uh, and then describes his own ministry as one of being servant. So is there something that we, some sort of thematic direction a preacher could take with that is kind of where I'm landing. Well, the vocabulary is different, but Philippians 2 opens itself up to that nicely, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, um, there it's, it's slave language. It's even more perhaps extreme in the kind of service we're talking about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that's powerful in the sense that, um, You're describing, uh, the text is describing these women as Christ-like before they were called Christian, right? And 
that Christ likeness that so often, uh, if we do the procession, becomes a pomp and circumstance. And I think it's really powerful for us in this particular cultural moment to be attentive to how can we care for others. And that Jesus, in some ways, in this moment is being lifted up because of a life and a ministry of service. And so rather than putting the um, the emphasis on the pomp and circumstance, put the emphasis on why. Why are people looking to Jesus? And we're looking to Jesus because of what Jesus has done. And how many, if, if to use that um, dramatic language from Philippians where it's going to use the slave, slave language, how many of those who serve us are ignored, are erased, are mm -hmm. forgotten? Well, and we could pull that in from the Psalm too, right? Psalm 31, yes. your face shine upon your servant, uh, save me in your steadfast love. So that's another way we could maybe connect connect the passages. Anyway, that's just mm -hmm. one thing that I, I thought Just of. one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Mark's <clears throat> Mark has always been dismal in its description of the passion. And as I reread it again to prepare for this, I wrote, look how dismal this is. <laughs> <So> <laughs> the, you know, the isolation, the rejection <clears throat> from everybody, and apparently even from God, if we take the cry of dereliction seriously, that this is just bleak in every possible way. There's okay. no beauty anywhere. There's no love or friendship or loyalty expressed anywhere with the exception of the women who watch from a distance, but Mark withholds that detail until after Jesus dies, which is yes. peculiar. So you have to suffer this death. Uh, you have to observe the suffering of this death and all of its loneliness first before you, you, you get that. Yeah. And then to contrast that with the, the, the palm Actually, there's no palms in Mark. They're just leafy branches. Who knows? Leafy branches. I like oh, to think. Come on, are there palms? I think it was cabbage. Um, something <laughs> leafy was put on the road. But <laughs> the the way that's orchestrated by Jesus, the way there's some cloak and dagger behind, you mm -hmm. know, how people mm -hmm. find the the animal to ride. And there's something very public about that. I think it's probably not a large scale scene. This is probably more of a of a sign act by a prophet in, in a, for a limited audience. I don't think people are hanging out of their balconies and screaming and yelling for Jesus, but that doesn't make it any less meaningful. But then when it ends, he goes to the temple and he looks around at everything. I believe it's Perry Blepo there in Greece, yes. which often is of not just a casual looking around, but there's some power in that glare. Uh, and of course, then he goes outside, he leaves us, he refuses to sleep in the city or can't sleep in the city, who knows, but that's not told why, but he stays out of the city. And then he'll go back, of course, the next day and the temple act takes place. So he has come, he's come to provoke. Yes. And he's going to provoke and he's going to spend every minute of chapter 11, verse 12 through the end of chapter 13 in or around the temple precinct. And he's going to make a lot of people angry. So it's, just to kind of, often people talk about the crowd being so fickle. How can the crowd that loved him in chapter 11 be absent in chapter 14? That's part of the story, but it's also this idea of the purpose he comes to die and to die a particular kind of death. And he has to know this provocation is going to make him deeply unpopular with the powerful people, even as it makes him more popular with some. So not to set up Jesus as somehow trying to orchestrate a kind of death by cop or something like that. I don't want to go that direction at all. But there is something about this shift of popularity and and who he will be as a public person that's so dramatic and so terrible and and so horribly that I that it just deserves some attention, not just to experience the story better, but then to start to get into the question of what is it about this death? Where does the power possibly reside in this death? And I think for Mark, the answer is nowhere at all until you come back Easter morning. And even then you're not going to know what to do with it. But I, I went to that verb as well, Matt, 
Um, Mary Bleppo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. I because then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple, and when he looked around at everything, everything. on us, right? He look he looks around at everything, and it's Perry Bleppo, and so it, you know it's just this this whole sort of scanning, and I think that could be also a great homiletical entry into today mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. of putting putting the listeners into that moment of looking around at everything and what what do you see what and and as you mentioned Matt that we've got a few chapters before we get to the arrest right so that uh but that looking around at everything and taking it all in uh and what what might that look like or or feel like on this Sunday going into and what do you want people to look at and see given uh given given the text right given the passion text so it could be a it could be a way to direct to direct your sermon into this is what we see this is what we see this is what we see this is what Jesus saw uh and uh just and so to put them into that sort of rhetorical place, I think, would be really powerful. I love that. I love that. Harry uh, Blumel. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, th- the interesting thing that uh, it's, it's happening is Mark moves so quickly, right? That each thing is just sort of, it sort of happens. It's shorter. It moves through. You know, we get everything sort of, and then it stops, And particularly here, this all that is happening, um, uh, I I think that might be a way to go into this stopping and and looking uh, that you're lifting up, Caroline, as you were saying that. That's what I was thinking, is that, you know, so much of what we do is just that, isn't it? We we're 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 going along all the things that we have to get taken care of. And here's an opportunity to stop and look, slow down. And pay attention. And what better time to do that than when we understand the promises of God? Do we want to look at Isaiah? Yeah, I mean Isaiah, Isaiah and the Psalms seem more 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 appropriate to the if you're leaning more to the Passion Sunday. And they certainly fit the dismal character that Mark puts forth. Certainly. You know, that's the, the Michael Chan's work on Psalm 50 is really helpful mm-hmm. for me on the on the on the podcast, and this also is going to set up uh, so much of what we're going to experience on Good Friday as well, when mm-hmm. the Old Testament texts get called in mm-hmm. that and to mm-hmm. you know I'm, I'm not sure we can explain the whole tradition of of suffering being not well. It's a lot of Old Testament texts you might look at, but that whole experience of exile being seen as not necessarily suffering for punishment, but suffering as the means through which a new reality is going to emerge. Right? That mm-hmm. for all of the prophetic gloom and doom around the fall of Israel and around the fall of Judah, <clears throat> it's never the final act. It's always so that the nation might be reborn, so that something might. And of course, there's dangers to haphazardly applying that theology as if you are God or as if you can see the future. But to help people get a sense for how you're supposed to feel in response to these stories about disgrace. So it's not just that I go home feeling sad. Mm -hmm. I I think there's got to be more to it than that. How that idea of sadness and witnessing the destruction of a person or a nation somehow calls you to a sense of your own complicity, somehow calls you to resolve, but somehow also can call you to hope in a God who rebuilds. Mm -hmm. If I knew how to do that, I would be preaching in every pulpit this Sunday. I mean, I I think it's just a hard balance to draw when Mm -hmm. it comes to the emotions of this Sunday. But you two are better preachers than I am. So what do you think? How do you do that? <laughs> well, you you made me how do you think tend to the, how do you tend to the pathos of this day without it being manipulative, you know, or or yeah. or even worse, sappy, yeah. or just yeah. 
superficial. You, you made a you made a point around um, are not a imagine imagine. No, you made one a few point. points, a few every good ones. No, one point, every podcast I hope one, one. needs one point. Um, I, I'm throwing out all of them. Uh, you guys land. Uh, I just throw them out there for to look over there, look over there. But uh, um, one of one of them that I, I caught and followed for a little bit of a trajectory was uh, not thinking of ourselves to apply this theology as if we were God and we uh, know the future. Uh, and I think that's real important when we look at the Philippians text. It says, "Let this mind that was in Christ be also in us." Um, this isn't the mind that takes on uh, the pomp and circumstance. This is the mind that is, is takes on humility. This is the mind that attends to um, what God is doing in the world. And I think, uh, I think at our best, um, what we are is attending to or pointing to what God is doing in the world. And that takes away from us the responsibility of making things happen, but it does not take away our responsibility to do what God has called us to do. That 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 simple kind of distinction um, goes along with how we were talking about Jesus earlier, is that Jesus knew what Jesus had to do, um, and he, he, he acknowledged it, um, and then he followed through. Uh, and for us, we have to do the same. We have to acknowledge what it's the right thing for us to do and then follow through. It's not just enough for us to say it, um, and it's not enough for us to expect it of others. The mind that was in Christ is that this is my role, and I'm going to be responsible to it. I think to answer, I, yeah, I appreciate that, Joy, and I'll a very brief answer to your question: uh, how to, how to, how not to make the pathos of the day manipulative. For me, I come back to the uh, that Jesus entered Jerusalem and looked around, and I think if we invite people to look around and look at the look at the details of what of what this day is. You don't have to manipulate the pathos. It's there. Um, and when you are looking, and I think it's, I think it's interesting too, that you have this little diversion in between. You have one in Luke too, but where Jesus enters the, you know, enters Jerusalem, but before there's the cleansing of the temple, Jesus curses the fig tree. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, so there, I I think for me that that that's the that's the kind of the homiletical key is mm -hmm. uh, when you when you peri blepo and look around um, if you can't if you can't see the pathos of the moment then uh, like you said um, joy then what whose mind whose mind <laughs> are you uh, are you embodying? Are you embodying the mind of Christ and the mind of God, uh, or someone else? Or someone else's? Yeah. Uh, can I just say one more thing about Philippians too? This yeah, probably absolutely. Ruin, ruin your good ending, Caroline. Oh, but that's fine. <clears throat> somebody taught me once to look at the crucifixion narratives in the Gospels, not as explanations of what does this do for us, like what does this let in motion, mm. right? Let, let Paul talk about that. Let some other authors talk about that. That the, not, the the narratives are more interested in portraying um, what does the cross say about humanity? Mm -hmm. And Mark and Matthew, I think, wow. are the prime examples of that. What does yeah. it say about human beings when confronted with God? But also then what does the cross say about God? To imagine mm -hmm. that being the flesh of God, to use language from last Sunday uh, on the cross. And I think Philippians helps us answer that question, right? What does this say about God to have endured this? And the language of Philippians of a God who um surrenders mm -hmm. right doesn't regard equality with god as something to be exploited surrender mm -hmm. is the wrong word relinquish maybe a better word there and to see the cross as this strange act of love enacted through apparent powerlessness is a better way at approaching this week than thinking my task is to tell people what the cross accomplishes for them 
At least I'm not so sure that the Gospels alone can answer that question, but they can invite us into some deep reflection about it once we ask, what kind of God are we talking about and what kind of humanity are we a part of? Big week ahead for our preachers. Mm -hmm. So we will be praying for all of you and you will be busy, but hopefully it's a chance for you to worship as well as lead. <laughs>